have we revisited another uh, a director that we've done on the podcast yet or is it freaking the first yeah i don't think so uh, i mean other than when we did the you know specific the director. Yeah, yeah i don't think we've ever gone back and redone another one i don't mm -hmm. think yeah i think since those lists obviously when we do the lists um you're gonna hit we highlighted directors where we'd watch multiple versions of their films but those podcasts were marathons in terms of length and also in terms of like how many movies we'd have to watch to prep for them yes yes those were endurance tests in every way i think i still feel the soreness from sitting in my chair so long some of those <laughs> some of those five hour sessions yeah they were they were pretty long i remember i did an interview that was like nine or ten hours long with this uh he was a fellow filmmaker and uh i think he's in the west west coast somewhere but uh we we had our films released by the same label for a few years and i would always see his movies and his names pop and his name pop up so and we started talking, we had a certain similarities with age and with the type of movies we did. So we just talked and talked and talked. And I think it was like nighttime and then the sun came up and we're still talking. And it was just like, I was like, I'm never doing that ever again. <laughs> so even though we had some pretty long podcasts, I've had even longer, unfortunately. Yes, well, there is something cool about that. There's something to be said for that when the conversation is just so good and uh, you can't stop until the sun comes up. Yeah, but when you yourself are the common denominator, you realize <laughs> you're the problem. <laughs> well, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Yeah, maybe I should just shut up sometimes. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think this is the first filmmaker we've done twice. And uh, yeah. I definitely won't be the last, but, um, but yeah, we did no. him for The Exorcist. And speaking of successful videos, those Exorcist videos were, I think, one of our most successful podcasts. So hopefully it's a freaking thing and uh, William Freaking Movies hit a note with people. Yeah, well, it could be. Um, I think definitely these are both movies that people like so uh they're more likely to tune in perhaps than a, a more recent film that they don't really know about or care about as much yeah well we watched this movie because we liked the exorcist yeah uh, i know for me like once i saw it and i saw the behind the scenes stuff on like how he is as a filmmaker his approach to filmmaking some of the stories he told he fascinated me and I, I wanted to watch more of his films and this was the other masterpiece that he had. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And uh, definitely a, a great film. Yeah, uh, so this one he did before The Exorcist just kind of got him on the map. And uh, I think he beat out a few really good films. He may have been beaten out a Scorsese film, a Kubrick film, but uh, this was a good year or a good time in filmmaking where you're going into the 70s here and you're talking about, you know, Hollywood New Wave, more of a prefer fuck. I keep screwing this word up. Um, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> oh, I can't speak. Uh, what's this word I'm looking for? It's uh, God fucking damn it, man. I need to go back to school. <laughs> Well, we are in the no rules. So <laughs> I know, I need to go to a film school with rules because clearly. <laughs> yes, uh, well, we can pronounce it however we want. Uh, whatever. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no. I, can, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, okay. All right. All right. Proliferation. There you go. I, I forgot what the fuck I was using it for now. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, uh, there was a proliferation of great films, maybe, or... Something yeah, oh, yeah, something in the 70s. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pro proliferation yeah. of something in the 70s. Yeah. Yes. I'm so undoubtedly. Like, undoubtedly. I'm so caught up in the pronunciation, I completely <laughs> forgot my point. <laughs> well, you were talking about Freakin and all the other great filmmakers. That, yeah, uh, you know, there was a yeah. proliferation of, I guess, more violence. Maybe I was, I was aiming for uh, Hollywood New Wave. Um, you know, th these type of films like these, 
where it moved away from so yeah with with like the 40s you had the film noir and a lot of behind the scenes stuff i i, I saw about this film compared it to film noirs and then obviously after that you had more optimism in, in, in the country in the u.s after world war ii and um you had more positive uh films and then you also had tv so to get people to the theaters you had like musicals and technicolor and all these different gimmicks to get people into theaters so darker filmmaking kind of went away for a while you know literally you know you're moving away from noir um so this was kind of like a switch back to that after the 50s and the 60s with the the big budget stuff the 70s you had a different wave of filmmakers you know you had like i mentioned kubrick and scorsese and freaking and all these young filmmakers that these auteurs um mm -hmm. that that came through and they had a lot more freedom in in the type of things that they would do and you know uh with the the haze code being gone and you could show more violence and sex and things like that so this film came out around at a great time where you could really break the rules and show more than you couldn't so the timing of this film was great i think time kind of detracts from this film in a way though because it doesn't feel as special the things that made this mm. film special at the time yeah i suppose it's been copied a lot and uh and just the whole kind of more violent more realistic kind of gritty filmmaking that's just become much more normal i suppose since that time but but yeah i was going to say that i think the Hayes code came to an end in either 67 or 68 so really right before this film was made so this was kind of a fresh thing to not have to worry about those kind of rules and that censorship and uh, another thing i've heard about this era is that it's kind of a, a first generation of filmmakers who kind of went to film school and studied film and you know the old guys you know they were just you know they worked their way up at the studio you know they started out on you know assistant jobs or whatever they worked their way up and they learned the craft you know but these were guys who went to film school studied film loved film and started making much more uh, auteur like films i guess to use that word you know they were more um, serious in a way artists i suppose you could say they had a vision they weren't just part of the, the machine you know trying to make a product absolutely um this film is is innovative in a lot of ways but much like any film that's before your time you don't know if certain things you're seeing are happening for the first time or they were cliched at that time as well you know mm -hmm. but you definitely see things that have been copied since this you know the whole thing with the cops stopping the car and like give me your car and then going off in a chase <laughs> like how many times have you seen that maybe this yes. film started it maybe it was cliched even when this was done but um it's hard to tell but it definitely um it was a popular film that that did a lot of things that were copied afterwards even mm -hmm. certain scenes i'm watching like they felt so realistic that it reminded me of a tv show here in the states i don't know if it was popular in canada called cops oh yes, yes and they definitely. they followed cops around documentary style just following them do on their beat you know uh you know catching criminals in different cities and certain scenes kind of felt straight out of cops you know it felt <laughs> that it felt that real you know so yeah um yeah and i think that's something that freaking was interested in was having a more documentary like feel and making it more it seems like the camera is just accidentally capturing these moments like you're not actually setting up a really uh, artistic shot necessarily you're just kind of like Oh, here's something that's happening and the camera happens to see it i think that's uh what he was going for absolutely there's a lot about this film that felt realistic there's a lot about this film that makes it unique that it makes it great and it also detracts from it and it's the exact same approach like the realism the grittiness the um procedural aspects are all things that make this film stand out and great but it's also things that doesn't make it age as well because once you've seen these things done no fault to this movie it pioneered a lot of stuff but once you've seen this stuff done over and over and over again then all that it boils down to is a story and the characters and there is no story and there is no characters it's just you're following procedures you know you don't really know much about these people 
um, that was part of uh, Gene Hackman's frustration. It's like, give me something with this character. But there was nothing to this character. Um, you know, and, and I think that can hurt it with time in the sense that uh, a viewer now going back at this and, and revisiting, it's like, what makes it so special? It's like, I've seen all this stuff already. Well, yeah, you've seen it already because they, a lot of them copied this film. And then um, once you look past all the action, and you're just looking at the, the story, the dialogue, the characters, not a lot to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like, I obviously, I'd seen the movie before, and I quite liked it. And watching it again, I was surprised by how little story there really is. You know, like, it's, it's almost like, in a way, it's almost like a series of chase scenes or, you know, chase scenes plus following people. <laughs> You know, like it's 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 on the move. It's always on the move, and there's not a lot of scenes where they stop and really talk about stuff, and we really get to know people, as you're saying. Like it's more like action, action, action. We're moving forward, and it's very well done. You know, and it really is quite gripping. But uh, but yeah, I sort of expected there to be a little more to the story in a way. But um, in terms of the characters, I would say that you know it's not so much that they don't have a. a character or a personality but that they're not necessarily uh very heroic you know or very uh, nice in a way like there, there's a lot of negativity to these characters like popeye doyle you know is is he a guy we should admire and like or is he kind of a bit of a jerk you know and does he kind of break the rules and do some things that he shouldn't do is he a nasty kind of a guy is he the kind of cop who would get himself in trouble today if you know what i mean I don't think that's a question. I think the question, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. What are we questioning? Yeah, yeah he is that guy. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Where are we going yes. with this? He is. <laughs> well, well, that's, you know, so as a character, you know, this is not somebody that you can admire, particularly. No. Like, we're no. not used to that. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, you know, I discovered James Bond movies. And I also discovered Charles Bronson movies around the same time when I would watch them on TV whenever they came on. And and I remember years later saying to a friend of mine, you know, when I was a kid, James Bond and Charles Bronson were kind of like my heroes. And I said, who was your hero? And this guy said, Popeye Doyle from The French Connection. <laughs> and I don't think I'd even seen The French Connection at that point. But now when I look at it, I go, what kind of hero is he? You know, that's uh, now I question that guy's choice of hero when he was a kid. But um, anyway, yeah, he's, he's not a very heroic character yeah when you talk about heroes or anti-heroes from this era especially cops or um authority figures or guys walking around with guns either cops or vigilantes either way there are people shooting minority criminals you really realize how political this stuff was and around this time this thing is these movies were occurring and you're watching them as a kid you know, you're either watching them in syndication or on TV, you know, you know, or you're watching, you know, or you're renting them from the video store uh, because you're young and these movies are, I mean, they're really old. So even if you saw them when you were young, they were still before your time. But as you're watching these movies as a kid, for me, I, I, I enjoyed them. But looking back and as an adult, they're really like conservative Republican geared films. You know, it's mm -hmm. like every criminal gets the death penalty. You steal a purse, <laughs> boom, dead. You know, it's like, it's yeah. very capital punishment. And you, as a kid, you didn't realize how political these movies were. You know, you were just naive mm -hmm. to it. But these movies are, are, are super political. Even Hackman was talking about it. He didn't get into the politics of it. But he got into the fact that he's a liberal and he found it hard and difficult to play this character and say some of the racial things that this character would say. He found mm -hmm. it extremely difficult to do it. And I thought about that, you know, after I, I saw the interview and then I watched the movie, I'm like, yeah, I could see what he's saying. It's like mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff is like, there's no gray area. It's this guy is, he's, it's black and white, you know, mm -hmm. you break mm -hmm. the law, death penalty, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And uh, it's interesting too, that uh, just, Earlier this year, there was a big thing uh, when it was discovered that Apple TV and the Criterion Channel and some places had apparently removed 
some of those racist lines from this film mm. when it was stream streaming on the channels and of course you know really upset all the purists and you know you know it's like altering a work of art etc cetera, etc cetera. um i'm not sure if anybody i don't know if anything came of that whether they reversed their decision or are they still censored i, I don't know but um but what do you what do you think about that do you think they should change films like that or should they just leave it as uh, this is what it is oh hell no change films i mean you can't whitewash <laughs> history i mean it is what it is i mean yeah i mean grow a set i mean you know if you if it's yeah. too harsh for you to deal with then don't watch it you know mm -hmm. I, I don't believe in whitewashing films or history or anything things are mm -hmm. what they are deal with it yeah it's life yeah. you know yeah um i mean I, I, he said a lot of harsh things but i'm not like gonna go cancel gene hackman if he if he's <laughs> even still alive I, I think freaking died like a year ago, but I'm not going to dig up his corpse and cancel him. You know, it's, it's <laughs> no. a different time, you know, it's, and it's just a movie yeah. and it's just a movie reflecting the times, you know, do you want <laughs> accurate portrayal of the times or do you want to whitewash history and do like a 1984 and, you know, just write the history that you want, you know? Yeah. And of course, you know, that, part of the point might be that this guy is racist you know this character is a racist character so that doesn't necessarily mean the film is racist it's just this is you know they're showing you the way the guy is you know and he is based on a real a real guy right a real and the real guy was in the movie too yeah both, <laughs> he was. Of, both of the cops yeah. yeah yeah so you know it's in a way i guess it's just honesty and you know this is I mean, he obviously didn't have a problem being portrayed like that in this film. <laughs> so there must have been uh, some truth to that, right? And, and from all indications, he fought for this portrayal of himself, you know? Yeah. The only yeah. thing you really know about the character is that he's obsessed. And again, I can feel, I can see where Hackman's coming from. It's like, give me something to work with here. I'm an <laughs> actor. Let me act. Because I was yeah. watching this, and I'm looking at Roy Schneider, who's a great actor. I think he was in a film called All That Jazz, and he was in Jaws. So he was in a couple of mm -hmm. films where you could really see his acting. And I'm thinking, yeah. and, he, and in the behind the scenes, he was talking about, oh my gosh, this was such a big break for me, such a huge movie, blah, blah, blah. And I'm looking yeah. at his performance, and I'm like, he really doesn't have anything to do. And I'm looking at the film like, most of these actors don't have anything to do. And it's like you said, it's just a series of chases and people following each other. It doesn't make the movie bad, um, no. but it does. It it does show you like literally, you're watching one thing, and in that one thing, you're finding all these extreme positives and these extreme negatives from this same one thing you're watching. Kind of like how people watch this film. Yeah, it's a great film, but we want to take this line out and that line out. You're seeing a lot of positive and negative in the same one thing you're watching, and uh, it's very unconventional is very pioneering but a lot of the things again that makes it so unique also detracts from it yeah yeah it's um uh, it's very interesting for sure yeah um yeah it's it feels very again you know feels very real very gritty very uh, almost documentary like uh what about all the locations as a New I loved Yorker. it. I yeah. loved it. As a New Yorker, like when I came to this country as a kid, I mean, obviously this is the 70s. I came here like the early 80s and stuff like that. But um, it still kind of felt that way. And I'm watching this. I'm like, my God, like the only thing missing in this film is stray dogs running around. But it was just like, man, this is this is old New York. And I yeah. love we watched um, Tarkovsky's film. And uh, you watched uh, Solaris and also all the behind the scenes stuff and the things I read and watched about uh, Tarkovsky is he loved texture in his films. That's why he loved rain and, you know, characters walking on uneven surfaces and all these different things. This film has so much texture with the trash and the, the, the smoke and the wind and things blowing and it, there's a lot the the puddles there's a lot of texture you're watching this film and you feel dirty you feel like you're walking through a scary alley when these cops yeah. are doing it the on location it's not just the on location shooting is the authentic ghettos and slums and the the burning bronx look of this film 
that makes it great. If this film, this exact same film, was shot like a Hitchcock film, where it's just very artificial and studios and fake backgrounds and people pretending to drive with like a projector, rare projector behind them, this movie would be ass. It wouldn't be anything good <laughs> because it's just people walking around chasing each other. The fact that they're in these real locations and what you're watching feels so real, it feels real because you have authentic people, you have a lot of cops playing different characters, not even just playing cops, playing different characters. I don't know if part of that was to get authenticity or to get them employment since they're there, like giving them stories and showing them how things are really done. Regardless, you have real people in these scenes um, that are not just being paid to be in the movie, but you have real people who didn't even know they were in a movie, in the movie. Uh, you had real locations, authentic criminal type locations. You had the, 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 the documentary style. You have people, there's no make, I don't think people are even wearing makeup in this film. You're seeing like real faces, you know, you're not seeing like these uh, model type stars in this film. You're not seeing, you know, a young Tom Cruise in this film. You're seeing a Gene Hackman balding, yeah. you know, Gene Hackman running around out of breath yeah. in, in this film. There's so many different aspects of it. The documentary style, I can keep going on, but there's so many things that they, that they did consciously to make this film feel real. And it, it all pays off because it feels extremely real. Yeah. And I think that's something, too, that was maybe groundbreaking about this is that they were showing places in New York that maybe never had been shown before on film. You know, a, a lot of films just concentrate on the nice parts, you know, and they show you the glamorous parts. But this was taking you into some pretty gritty areas that people maybe had not seen or, or certainly not seen often. And so it was kind of eye opening in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also find it interesting that uh, the screenplay was apparently written by Ernest Tidyman, who we talked about before because he also wrote Shaft and he adapted his own novel, Shaft, and it came out the same year as this movie. Um, and apparently they had, uh, they went through a bunch of writers trying to get this script right. And they had wound up reading, I think, an early version of Shaft and they said, yeah, this is the guy to do it. Um, Although I think that Friedkin kind of tries to take credit for maybe uh, telling him what to do and all that. But in my mind, that's kind of the way it is when you're a writer working with a director or a big producer, you know, like it's not uncommon that they tell you, okay, here's what we want, you know, go and do it. And it doesn't mean that you're not doing the job of being the writer, you know, just because you're following their instructions. But regardless, um, I think it's interesting because you can kind of see some parallels in a way to to Shaft, also a very New York movie that shows you a lot of New York locations. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, well, you said a lot there. There are two things I want to focus on that you said. One is the writing of the film. And um, honestly, I mean, you're right. There's a controversy of like who gets credit for it. And I know this is your, 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 your wheelhouse, you're a writer, you're a writer for hire, you you get your stuff butchered. Um, what are people trying to take credit for here? Like, yeah. <laughs> what's so special about the script? You know, it's like, honestly, like, where's the great lines? Where's like, where's the great scenes? It, a lot of what makes this movie special is things that they probably just came up with on the fly. Hey, like, I'm going to trace you in this project building and we're going to have this shootout. You're going to shoot a woman pushing a stroller and I'm going to chase you and we're going to have a car chase with a train. Like, the scripting that, I, I doubt, like, a lot of that was, like, scripted out word for word. I think a lot of that is just, like, all right, the director and the actors and producer on the set, like, plan this out maybe a few days ahead of time. It's like, hey, let's do this. I don't think that's meticulously thought out by a writer with a script. And, and as far as the dialogue, I, I don't know, like, dialogue or plot points or plot lines i don't think there's anything there that people should be like fighting tooth and nail over like no i wrote this no you wrote that <laughs> come on what what is there i mean you're the writer am i missing something is there anything to fight about with the script 
I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, I personally don't think Friedkin should be trying to take credit. I mean, that's, you know, even if he was, you know, dictating a lot of ideas, I mean, that's just part of your team. I mean, it's the same way, you know, he might say, okay, put the lights over there and make sure you light his face good. Does that mean he's now the DOP and he's the, the lighting expert? You know, no, he's the director. So he's got a, a strong vision and he's telling people what he wants and then they're actually doing the job. So he should just be saying, yeah, you know, Tidyman did a great job of capturing what I wanted, you know, and, and there it is, whatever it is. Um, but no, I don't think it's a, a super brilliant script full of all kinds of great dialogue, but maybe it is exactly the script that they needed for this film. And it kind of reminds me, I've heard the same story about MASH. Apparently the writer of MASH, they took his script and, you know, Altman, he loves improv and they, they kind of improv and they changed things. And the writer was so annoyed that he, he, you know, didn't want his name on it, but then he wound up winning the Academy Award and he accepted it, you know. Um, but uh, Altman said, look, he wrote the script and that's what we based what we did on, you know, like without his script, we couldn't have done what we did. And so he kind of gave all the credit to the writer, even though he changed a lot. But I feel Friedkin is doing the opposite, where he's like, hey, I made suggestions and I told him what to do. I don't think this guy did anything. You know, he's, he's not the gracious kind of uh, leader, maybe, that Altman may have been. That's the way it seems to me. Yeah, I guess from my point of view, I'm saying that I don't care. I'm not saying that, <laughs> oh, I think this person's right. I'm thinking that person's right. I'm saying like, you know, for instance, this... Uh, I don't want to dismiss this because you're a writer and you feel passionate about this. So I'll bring up a different scenario where a script was actually really good and it affected the movie where this exact same thing happened. Spartacus. Cooper came onto Spartacus and then I think he had worked with Kurt Douglas before in Paths of Glory and maybe Kurt Douglas got him, got him the director for hire gig with Spartacus and Cooper came in with a lot of ideas. And he wanted credit for a lot of these ideas. And then Kurt Douglas was like, no, give it to the writer. So it was a back and forth, like how much did Kubrick write? How much credit should Kubrick write and the writer get? And that's the movie where Spartacus was an amazing script. Like, do you not get chills when you still remember the scene? I am Spartacus, I am Spartacus, that's a great scene. There's so yeah. many great scenes and so much great dialogue. I'm not saying Spartacus is a better movie than French Connection or French Connection is a better movie. I'm just talking about scripts in general. Mm -hmm. Like that was a movie with good plots and stories and characters, very different movies. Um, no. But that's a, a director and a writer, you know, arguing over a script that matters for me. It's like, what the no. fuck are we arguing about? You know, it reminds <laughs> me of The Room. The Room was like, a, you know, the, the, the Room, the because there's a few movies named The Room, The Room, so bad it's good in The Room. Where yes. it's, a, it's a movie, it's so bad it's good. And then it blows up and then, everyone starts fighting over credit of the movie and it's like wait a minute the movie is so bad that's why we like it so why are you fighting over credit who deserves credit for the movie's success and that's kind of like what uh one of the actors was saying it's like you know this um this uh i don't know if he was a dp but he was some kind of crew member and he was saying no i directed all these scenes on set and he didn't direct any of it but like dude the direction was so bad. That's why we like it. Like, why are you fighting for credit for being, you know, incompetent? You know, so it's kind of like that. I'm not saying this script was incompetent, but this script wasn't this work of art that you guys should be like fighting over like decades later. But even in the yeah. behind the scenes stuff I saw, like freaking was still taking credit for it. Yeah. And I don't know that anyone else was fighting. I think, you know, freaking was the only one that I saw really talking about it. I don't know if Tidyman ever said anything. So I didn't see anything with the writer, but the behind the stuff stuff I saw, uh, yeah. like literally everyone else was saying the writer deserved credit and freaking was saying he deserved credit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, leaving any negative stuff aside, this movie was great. Yeah. It's uneven. It's not the masterpiece that I think The Exorcist was. I don't know if you agree with me or not. But it was still a masterpiece nonetheless. Yeah, uh, I would agree. I mean, I think uh, this came out before The Exorcist. And, and I think, uh, yeah, I think he made an even better movie with The Exorcist. And I've certainly 
watched The Exorcist more times, and it's certainly something I feel a lot more strongly about than, although I do really like The French Connection, I enjoy it, uh, but a lot of what I enjoy is the action and, you know, the intense chase scenes and stuff like that. It's not, again, it's not necessarily a brilliant story or script, it's just that it's an exciting movie to watch, and it's gritty, and it's interesting, but it's, no, I would say The Exorcist is probably the better movie of the two. Mm -hmm. For me, what I love most about this film is the time capsules, capsule aspect of it. The New York it captures, maybe that's being a New Yorker that, that, yeah. that puts me in that direction. Maybe it's the type of films I do, the type of films that I'm capable of doing. Like this would be like, for me, if I could, if everything worked out perfect for me, I could make a movie like this based on my skills, based on my resources, this is the ultimate for me. So for me, like something like this is great because I, I love guerrilla filmmaking. I love real locations. I, all of that stuff that this film does, I love. Um, yeah. But as a fan of films, I, I love story and I love characters and I love dialogue. And, you know, this film doesn't have a lot of that stuff, but the stuff that it does have with, with the real New York, the, the onset shooting, the look of the film, the locations, how dirty it felt, how gritty it felt, the 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 lack of music, the lack of makeup, the I don't know, the real act, the real people instead of actors. Those are the aspect, the gorilla aspect of this, the gorilla filmmaking, is is what I love most about this film, and I also love the ending. Um, there's not a lot you can say about the character, the stories, the plot. The one thing that does resound true is that this act this main character doyle he he's obsessed to a fault and the ending was perfect he's so obsessed he ends up killing another cop and he doesn't yeah. even have time to feel emotion about killing the cop because he's so obsessed with finding that criminal you know that he yes. thinks is out there that's getting away and it ends with the gunshot you know who's being shot whose gun was fired and then it just goes black it was perfect and that yeah. connection with him that french connection with him <laughs> where you know he yeah. does have that first chase scene and he waves to him when the train yes. door closes and then yeah. as the guy thinks he's getting away Duel walks up to him and waves yes. to him as like he yes. thinks he's getting away. So that connection really works yeah. too. So um, for me, those are the aspects of the film that really stand out to me that makes it timeless and that makes me love it. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would say also the fact that it is essentially based on a true story. They fictionalized it, they changed the names of the characters, but it, it was a, a true incident where there was a huge uh, heroin bust, the largest in history, and, and and a lot of this stuff really happened more or less the way they kind of say it does. Uh, but they fictionalized it for some reason, and they gave them different names. But but it, again, it just adds to the realness. You know, it's like this is the real thing that happened, and we're kind of showing you all the real locations. And yeah, it's just a it's an amazing piece of gritty realism. The credits began with an intensity usually reserved for horror. It almost sounds like music from Psycho smacking us right between the eyes as the first title hits the screen, quickly followed by the title of the movie, The French Connection. Like the beginning of William Friedkin's The Exorcist, which he made after this, The French Connection seems to want to knock us off balance or start making us tense right from the opening seconds. And then we find ourselves in Marseille, France, again, kind of like The Exorcist, which starts in a foreign land. We see a man walking, eating, and observing some possibly illicit activity. Later, we see him murdered, shot in the face in an over-the-top moment of brutality. The killer, who we see in close-up so we might be able to recognize him later, seems completely calm and cold-blooded. He stops to tear off a piece of the dead man's loaf of bread before calmly walking off. And then we go to Brooklyn, New York. This is almost a perfect parallel for the opening of The Exorcist. It's less complicated and strange, but somehow just as unnerving. Do you have any thoughts about this opening sequence? 
Yeah, I loved it when he went and picked up the bread. I'm like, that's what, <laughs> that's what I would do in my movie. I remember I did a movie where this guy killed a stripper by shoving a knife up her pussy. <laughs> And then as he walked away, he threw money on her. <laughs> like, <laughs> nice. I remember I, I had another scene where, um, this one, I was actually in this scene. I was directing myself where um, Hooker's in Revolt. And uh, he was paying off this hooker to like keep quiet or something. Then he shoved a dollar bill in her mouth, you know, and then smack, <laughs> and then he took his gloves and just smacked her across the face with it as he walked out. But just stuff like that, where it's just like insult to injury or just like, you know, funny yeah. things like that, where you just have cruelty mixed with humor yeah. uh, or violence mixed with humor. Um, I, I, to me, that's 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 what stood out to me is the in your yeah. face violence where immediately we see someone get shot in the face and then it's cut with the humor that he, he ate some of the bread. Yeah. Yeah. And like you no, said, I there's so many so many patterns that you see developing with filmmakers like they have certain things they like to do certain way of doing things and i won't repeat all of the things that you mentioned but uh another thing that i noticed as well to add to what you 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 already mentioned as far as patterns we're seeing with this filmmaker is uh he doesn't like um a lot of big stars like he likes people who are just known for this role in his movie like they're not known for something before so they then you you're more immersed in the film because you're not watching a movie star you're watching yeah. this guy and if you have a movie star you're just gonna they're just gonna be synonymous with oh that's this is a tom cruise movie this is a jack nicholson movie no this is a william freaking movie and you're watching real people on screen you're fully immersed in what you're watching so um yeah just to piggyback on some of the things you already mentioned as well yeah totally so uh next thing we see is santa claus and he's talking to two little boys so this is actually a christmas movie how appropriately we're talking <laughs> about this as we're getting very close to christmas i had no idea this was a christmas movie we were very smart to choose it oh um, <laughs> so we don't know it yet but santa is actually our hero of sorts pop by doyle in disguise and there's a man nearby buying a hot dog he's actually buddy russo uh, popeye's partner and buddy walks into a bar and he starts shaking people down and a man comes from the back and he makes a quick exit and buddy chases him out onto the street and santa claus quickly follows and this is actually the first chase scene of the movie and this one's on foot. They're running through the streets and it's pretty gritty and intense. They wind up kicking and beating the suspect. They threaten him, they intimidate him. They want him to give up his supplier. And then Popeye goes into this crazy shtick about Poughkeepsie, which uh, becomes a bit of a theme. And he basically is asking this guy if he's ever been in Poughkeepsie, if he's been picking his feet in Poughkeepsie. And eventually the guy kind of says, yes, yes, I, I, I was there. And, uh, and, you know, so it's, it seems to be one of his techniques that he does all the time because people later in the movie say to him, hey, Popeye, are you still picking your feet in Poughkeepsie? And uh, it seems to me that it's, it's to throw the suspects off balance and get them to admit to things that they may not even have done and they don't understand. Um, and, you know, right away, this character of Popeye, he, he seems not quite admirable you know he's very gritty and real but you know we're not really sure if we like him you know is 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 he a good guy is he a good cop i don't know and his partner does seem to be a little more reasonable and that does help a little bit but uh again i'm left with that question of are these good cops or bad cops you know how are we supposed to feel about them and has that changed over the years i don't know um any thoughts about this yeah, so R. Kelly is um, one of my favorite R&B artists, and he obviously went to jail for a long time for doing a lot of cruel things. I wish someone like you was on jury, because you'd be like, <laughs> yeah, he peed on her, and, you know, she is underage, but do we really know that he's the bad guy? <laughs> <You> know, <it's> like... <laughs> 
<laughs> your way of judging things are just unique. Uh, oh. But yeah, small correction. I think his partner was also undercover and he was selling hot dogs, not buying one. Oh, so was he they selling were just one? Like, yeah, I think they were just okay. both undercover in terms yeah. of minor thing, though. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's, it's funny. Uh, as I'm saying, like, you know, these are unconventional types. You see Hackman running around. You know, you see the big bald spot growing at the back of his head and puffing and puffing, trying to chase this guy down. Again, a yeah. very unconventional lead character. Um, and you see this image. Uh, again, this is one of my favorite aspects of the movies, the location shooting of like the burning Bronx. I don't know what, or where, where this was shot or whatever, but obviously New York, but I'm not sure where in New York, but you have this site of this just abandoned, uh, you know, um, real estate, whatever you want to call it, space, uh, where there's no building or anything um, because there's just no value there of building anything in this rundown ghetto neighborhood and just trash everywhere and a little fire and that's where they're chasing this criminal down into that is what makes this scene stand out it's just the location of it you know it's just amazing and you're right that pukipski scene where it's just like <laughs> i think he would he would get me on that because i can't even pronounce proliferate so i'm gonna get pukipski you know so i'll be yeah. like yes I did it. I killed them all, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you get the in-your-face violence uh, right away, and you get your main characters established right away. Good stuff. Looking forward to more. Yeah. So we go back to Marseille, where we meet Alain Charnier, or Frog Number 1, as he will later be labeled. Um, and he appears to be a successful businessman involved in shipping, he has a huge mansion on the sea, and he has a young, beautiful girlfriend or wife. So we kind of are introduced to him. And then we go back to New York, and we see that uh, Buddy's hand is bandaged where the suspect had cut him with a knife. And he just wants to go home, but Popeye wants to go out for a drink, and he talks him into it. And while they're at the bar, Popeye spots some drug dealers that he knows drinking with other people, including a guy who's spending a lot of money. And Popeye suggests that they tail him and they basically spend all night on, him, you know, and they witness a bunch of things and we don't fully understand what's going on. And we go back to Marseille and Alan Charnier or frog number one meets with the assassin who shot the man at the beginning of the movie and ate the bread. And uh, they're meeting with a TV star named Henri, who Alan thinks can help them. Uh, the assassin, whose name is Pierre, uh, he doesn't like the idea. It's a bad idea. We go back to New York. Buddy tells Popeye that the guy they've been tailing is Salvatore Boca. And Sal and his wife, Angie, who's only 19, they both have criminal records. They have a store or cafe called Sal and Angie's, and it only earns about $7,000 a year. So how is this guy driving two cars and tossing money around? And uh, they notice that he's constantly going back to this certain building where they happen to know Joel Weinstock lives. And they say that Joel Weinstock uh, bankrolled the big drug shipment from Mexico last year, or so they've heard. And later, they raid a bar, and Popeye singles out one guy who he forces into the bathroom, presumably for some private police brutality. But it turns out to be an act, and this guy is either undercover or he's an informant. And he basically tells Popeye that there's no drugs on the street, nobody's holding. And uh, he doesn't know Sal Boca or his wife Angie, but he's heard that there's a big shipment coming in either this week or the next, and uh, everybody's going to get, get, they're going to get well, they're going to get the drugs they need. Doesn't know exactly who or when. Uh, and at the end of the scene, Popeye punches the informer on the side of the face to make it look good. And then he and Buddy leave. And this is a scene that I must say, I've seen ripped off almost note for note in other movies. I'm pretty sure one of them was a Fred Williamson movie, but I can't remember which movie it was. But this is a scene that definitely has been imitated, where the cop is pretending to beat on the suspect, but it turns out, oh yeah, he's, he's undercover or he's an informant. Um, 
So they go back and they tell their boss oh, come about on, it. Man, you're killing me. This, this <laughs> you is it. This is it. Too much. I know, but this is this is the end of the moment here. So they they talk to their boss, and he's not impressed about this this theory about Sal being connected to Joel Weinstock. But they basically talk him into maybe trying to get a wire and looking into this a little more. And so he says he'll try. So there you go. So thoughts on this section. If I can remember from the beginning of when you started talking, <laughs> this movie has so little story. You just glanced over basically 90% of the story. Next, you, next we're going to go over a two-minute scene. Are you going to be like, thoughts? You know? Well, you know, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I remember where we started. You, you went over so much. Uh, so, back um, to Martin. Uh, speaking of 19-year-old girlfriends or wives, back to R. Kelly. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, this uh, this dynamic that is fully established in this and a lot of other crime films where you have the good guys and the bad guys, the cops and robbers, is the jealousy aspect where the criminals have the money, the nice houses, the gifts to give the young, beautiful girls, and the cops are generally like middle, lower class, tough guys trying to struggle and make it. And at the end of the day, you'll see the shortcuts that these criminal takes never pay off in the end. And, you know, going a straight and narrow route is what pays off. All the way back to Public Enemy when we did those gangster films where you had the two brothers who went down different paths. Um, so yes. that's, you know, that proliferates throughout this uh, crime films. And yes. throughout this movie, I will squeeze. I will squeeze proliferate into this as much as possible, or as long as I keep pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I found that interesting. I also like the cutting back and forth between you know France and and the U.S. and the d different on location shooting that you're getting um, at, at, from both sides. I thought that was pretty good. Um, and also, I think you get some voiceover here as well. Which again is reminiscent of film noir, which is something they, uh, the filmmakers have compared this to. It's like, uh, at that point, a contemporary version uh, of, of film noir and just a development of the crime genre itself. Um, so I found the voiceover interesting and the, the, the cinematography, very in your face cameras moving around. And believe it or not, this movie has nothing to do with Doris Wishman, but I'm seeing these like Italian guys and like, you know these like you know average looking below average looking people with these cameras like zooming up in their faces and it just reminded me of doris wishman her cinematography and her her films and an interview where she said man i i wish i had better actors they're all so damn ugly <laughs> <laughs> i don't know oh yes i just found that line hilarious and just seeing like the doris wishman ask cinematography Obviously, yes. they're doing it on purpose by having the camera in their faces and roaming around. But um, yeah. it's a little bit jarring seeing these actors without makeup and the cameras like pushing around in their faces in a movie that's great and a movie that's serious and a movie that's Academy Award winning, but still reminds me of cinematography I'd seen a Doris Wishman film. So um, yeah. all that stuff is kind of interesting. And, and, uh, like you've been describing and like i mentioned a lot of the story is being established here of like what's going to play out this movie doesn't have a lot of story it's kind of but this is kind of it this is kind of setting things up and then after here it's just going to be these people following each other around but this is kind of the setup as to why they're doing it so mm -hmm. and this was the first sort of following scene so it's kind of like the chase and the follow they're similar but different and uh and we don't fully understand anything yet we're just seeing a lot of things um and then from here we see henri the actor from france he arrives in new york with a lot of fanfare and we see his car being loaded off the boat and then popeye and buddy are told that they're going to have to work with these two federal agents Mulderig and klein and Bill Mulderig does not like Popeye, and he says that Popeye got a cop killed once before. And there's definitely a lot of tension here between these guys. And so Popeye and Buddy wind up listening to the wire that their boss uh, managed to get for them. And uh, they hear a French voice making an appointment with Sal Voca. 
So they tail Sal, which kind of leads them to Alain, and then to Pierre, and Popeye follows Alain to his hotel, and then later he meets with Bill and Buddy, and he says that uh, he's sure that this guy is a frog, and uh, he also thinks that the guy made him, and uh, Buddy says Pierre is also a frog. And uh, Bill says, look, nothing's happening. You know, we're watching these guys. Uh, why don't you go get some sleep? But Popeye's kind of worried that the feds are going to screw his case up. And there's a lot more tension between him and the feds. Um, any thoughts on this? So um, was it this section or previous section where we have the conflict with the captain and the officers? Um, I think that... Uh, there's more conflict coming. The only thing that's really happened was the scene where they tried to convince him that there's a case here and he's not really believing it, but he ultimately says, okay, fine. And, you know, yeah, so there was interaction with the, cap the captain in this section, Yes, right? there, there yeah. was, yeah. So you do get that aspect of it where you have the rogue cops and the captain trying to keep them in line. Again, something that's it's a staple of you know any um, detective or, or crime films involving the cops. You always have the rogue cops. You always have the contrasting cops, the good cop, bad cop, and then the captain that's always saying you guys are going too far. So even in something based on reality and something is true to reality and takes away a lot of the cliches in fantasy cop movies and, and cops and robber movies, you can see even based on reality, you have that dynamic that happens um in real life where it's like you know it's it's just something that's natural people will rebel against authority and in any dynamic where you have two people there's always going to be one person that feels he has to rein things in and the person that thinks we don't go too far and it's you realize when you strip away fantasy and that still happens that it's just part of human nature those kind of interactions so yeah, yeah. Well, that's interesting. And the captain is played by the actual um, Doyle. Uh, yes. Popeye Doyle. Eddie yes. uh, Egan, I think his name is. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And also the tension between the cops and the feds is also something you, you do see in a lot of yeah. other movies. Good point. And it's, Good point. it's happening right here as well. So there's just a lot of tension going on. And they're not really coming up with any facts. They're just following the people around, not really learning anything. Um, the next thing we see is a man testing some heroin, which he says is 89% pure, the best he's ever seen. And he tells them that they, they can be dealing on this load for two years if they buy this. And it'll be worth $32 million. And uh, Sal, who's brokering the deal, um, says that he only wants half a million dollars um but weinstock the guy we heard about he's a lawyer and he uh you know he's kind of stalling he doesn't want to just get the deal done and, uh, and he mentions that, that sal's phone lines are tapped so he knows this he's got inside information he knows that the police are listening he knows that they're being followed um and he basically says let's just take our time and make sure this is cool and uh and sal says well you know they're going to go somewhere else and sell it somewhere else and weinstock says well let them try you know it's not easy to put together half a million dollars so uh then we get to what i would call the big chase number one um you know we had a chase at the beginning but this is the big chase number one where popeye tries to follow alain and alain tries to shake him and it's interesting that popeye says that he thinks the guy made him already the day before but he's still following him so he doesn't sort of back off and say someone else better take over he continues following the guy even though he's been made and so uh, i think this is one of the best sequences in the movie i really love this scene where they're kind of you know playing that cat and mouse game and um at one point uh popeye calls in and he says hey i'm following frog number one and meanwhile, they think they're watching him at the hotel. They think he's still in the hotel. And he's like, no, he, he got past you guys and I'm following him. So this guy's very good at getting away from people and sneaking around. And uh, and he basically does the same here with Popeye. He, he ultimately gets away from him. Um, and uh, 
luckily the feds are tailing Sal at the same time and they tail him to Washington DC where he meets with Alain and uh, tells him that he needs a few more days and Alain is not happy uh, and he says I haven't been in the country for five minutes without a cop following me um, so the deal has to be made by the end of the week so Alain and Pierre talk on the plane and uh, they basically say the police are a problem and uh, Popeye is their biggest problem and Pierre says let me take care of it uh, and then this is where the boss the, the police captain really really gets mad at Popeye and Buddy and he tells them they blew it you know they've screwed this whole thing up the deal must have already gone down and they've wasted two months of time and he, he basically says get back to work and Popeye says no no you're wrong and there's more tension with the feds and then this is where we get Big Chase number two, which starts with a rooftop shooter trying to kill Popeye as he walks down the street. And this is probably, well, the greatest chase scene in film history. Um, it starts on foot and uh, the shooter who we eventually see as Pierre gets onto a train and Popeye commandeers a car from a private citizen and chases the train. And it's an incredible sequence. Um, do you have any thoughts on the stuff leading up or this chase sequence itself? You're going through too much of the movie, man. Like, <laughs> by the time you finish, I forget like how much of the movie we've even covered. Um, so, so there was this a great restaurant scene um, where we see the criminals eating in this beautiful restaurant and there's just well-cooked steak and they're just dining on these all these different courses and then outside you have Doyle watching them freezing cold you know and you can see the, the cold the, the air coming out of his mouth um as he's cold and then his partner you know um cloudy comes in with coffee and and a cold slice of pizza and he's like you know red or white you know yeah. joking yeah. you know as they're drinking coffee that it's wine and it's, it's this beautiful shot that starts in the restaurant and zooms in on them outside and then pulls back in so there's some really good cinematography if you didn't get it you know they're trying to spell it out for you you know these criminals yeah. are <laughs> living in the lap of luxury and these cops they are outside you know just digging around so i thought that was great there was also the subway chase scene where again was beautifully done where the hopping in and out of the subway car and then yes. uh Duel gets end up uh being caught on the outside and then we get the um the famous wave uh where the yes. criminal smirks and waves at him and then uh which uh, will get a call back later on in the film uh, which I thought was a clever scene and, you know, it made me smirk myself as I yeah. saw it. And uh, watching that scene, you have the main bad guy, the main protagonist and the main antagonist in the film. And listen to the behind the scenes stuff um, with Friedkin. He hated the casting of both of them. So he <laughs> saw this movie, this French movie with this actor. He's like, get me that actor. So the producers go in there like, yeah, we got him. He's at the airport. And, Freaking's all excited. He's waiting for him. He's like, who's this guy? Then suddenly some other guy like waves at him. He's like, he thought he recognized his face from something. And then he realized that they got him the wrong actor. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said, well, uh, I'm not actually French. I barely speak any French. Uh, but yet here yeah. he is stuck with someone he doesn't want. And the yeah. same thing with the lead actor. He did not want Gene Hackman. He wanted a complete unknown. Studio yeah. wanted someone of a known. And then Hackman was kind of in between, where it kind of satisfied both, but didn't really either, in that he wasn't yeah. a big star, but he was enough of a star, um, so that he was kind of a, a, a compromise fit for both of them. So yeah. yeah, in that famous subway scene, we see finally uh, some actual interaction with the two main characters as far as good and bad. And uh, yeah, I just thought it'd be an interesting time to bring up that, that casting yes. note. And I'm sure there are other things I wanted to say because but you <laughs> plowed through so much of the movie that I, I don't even know. 
But go ahead, plow through the rest of it, and then <laughs> ask me my thoughts. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we're at the big chase. So that was chase number one that you're talking about there at the yes. subway, and and now Jeez, we're. I at didn't chase... even get my chance. To, I didn't even get my say my thoughts on the chase number two. But well, well let's we're, plow we're, through the rest. Yeah. Of it. No, we're still there. We're still at chase number two, and uh, and it's interesting. Uh, we could comment here that uh, the same producer who made the French Connection, he had made a movie two or three years earlier called Bullet. And it had what was at the time considered to be the greatest car chase scene ever with Steve McQueen. And so when when they when he was making this movie, he said to Friedkin and the, and the rest of the crew, OK, I want you guys to top that scene. I want you to have a better chase scene than Bullet. And uh, and so they did. And I think that this is probably one thing that is completely fabricated in the sense of it's not part of the true story because they just needed a chase scene, you know, so they came up with this idea and, uh, and apparently they just shot it. They had no permission. They just kind of stole this scene, which is insane. You know, they were driving a car at high speeds through dangerous areas and they did actually have real car accidents, which are actually in the movie, right? They, they didn't cut it out. So it's, it's a crazy sequence and it, it may still be the greatest car chase ever. Um, you know, it's certainly it's it's as good if not better than the one in bullet and i don't know has anything topped it since then i don't know um what do you think do you do you think it's the greatest oh you're not going to skim over another 25 <laughs> minutes of the movie before i say my no thoughts. no no i'm no i'm opening this up for you here this is uh <laughs> so um i actually like the beginning of it as well so um doyle i guess he lives in a project building mm -hmm. um because earlier on we see he's eyeing this girl riding a more a bicycle and it's the second time he's eyed down a girl and with boots so i guess that's his fetish girls with boots yeah. and then uh we cut to him being handcuffed to his bed again something <laughs> we've seen in a lot of other movies since this you know yeah. um handcuffed with his own handcuffs to his bed and um his partner comes in, his partner has the keys to his place. Again, another thing we see a lot, the um, partner who's kind of like a spouse to the single guy. Um, the yeah. only thing that's usually added to these type of dynamics is the partner usually has a wife that we see. It's like, oh, this partner has a family and wife and kids. And this other reckless wild partner sleeping around and having all these wild escalades. You know, a movie that really came after this that popularized a lot of what we're seeing in this movie lethal weapon mm -hmm. we have the wild card the calm cop you know the cop always getting in trouble the hothead the lieutenant or the, the, the commissioner or whatever keeping them in order a lot of the cop tropes you know really popularized with lethal weapon and was copied throughout the 80s but this kind of had a lot of that stuff that even lethal yeah. weapon borrowed from but yeah you just have the the wild card duel with his wild escapades and things like that. But um, up until that first chase scene, not a lot was happening. You had the back and forth, you had a few walking, you know, you know, chase scenes, but not really anything major going on until that first shootout where Doyle yeah. is just walking. And it, obviously the assassin was aiming for Doyle, but he just happens to walk in front of a woman carrying her baby I mean, this, this scene was really gritty. The only thing they lacked was, you know, hearing the baby crying and then, you know, hearing a bullet go and suddenly the baby's silent, you know? <laughs> That's about it. But this yeah. poor mother just gets shot in the back just because she happened to walk past Doyle and then he's mm -hmm. hiding behind the tree. And you have a great scene that reminded me of like a Peck and Paw movie where you see the kids smiling at Doyle as he's in this gun shootout and they're just like smiling through the, the window at what's going yeah. on oblivious to the danger of it so I, I love that the start of that scene as he's running to the roof and then eventually get to the streets and like you said a lot of that stuff was just real people who did not actively participate in a movie but they were mm -hmm. in the movie which again is yeah. what i love guerrilla filmmaking that's what I'm, I'm all about so when i see it i love it and yeah a great chase scene um that um it's it's why the movie became famous and it ends with the poster shot of um him shooting the assassin in the back again something yes. very controversial at the time yeah. one you're shooting an unarmed man and 
Two, you're killing him. Yeah. You're shooting to kill. And then three, you're shooting him in the back. Which yeah. again, in this day and age, you know, they'd be a Republican hero. But back then, <laughs> it was very controversial and the cops didn't like it because there was no. a lot of cops on set. Um, you also, the cops that actually being portrayed in the scene. Uh, but in the end, when the movie screened, people loved it. But it was yeah. it was controversial on the set, controversial going to the producers. But uh, it not only did it get a big you know jolt from the crowd watching it in screening, it's on the poster. Yes, absolutely. And I think that the way they kind of make it work is that they show Pierre to be such a terrible guy. You know, I mean, he shot that guy in the face, ate his bread. And he killed two people on the train, you know, just brutally, just, you know, completely like there's no doubt that he is a bad guy, you know, and uh, there's no, you know, like there's no ambiguity there. You know, he he kind of deserves to be executed, you know, <laughs> whether you believe in that capital punishment or not. He's really a bad guy. So I think that's how they kind of get away with that, I think. But I love uh, how but, you list all those bad things he said and you mentioned. He ate his bread. <laughs> he ate his bread. Well, you know, like you said, insult to injury. I mean, that was a nice loaf of bread. They could have left it intact. Maybe he had a family who could have eaten that bread. But now there's a big chunk missing. I you know? drink your milkshake. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway, I think, yeah, it's very interesting that they did that and uh, they got away with it. But um the next part of the movie is also a big kind of sequence, and that is uh, the car sequence. And uh, it kind of starts out with Buddy and Popeye following Sal and Angie, and they park a Lincoln on the street and leave it there. And uh, uh, Popeye is convinced that that car is dirty, and we're going to sit here and we're going to watch this car, even if it takes all night, because somebody's going to come and they're going to collect the drugs that are inside this car. And of course, it doesn't work out that way. You know, another car comes along and it turns out that they're just opportunists, maybe wanting to steal the tires and stuff. So they, the police rush in and, you know, they're kind of blowing their cover. And so they, they haul the car in and they search the car and they tear it apart and they don't find anything. And Popeye is like, no, 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 this car is dirty. Keep looking. And the mechanic is like, no, it's clean. There's nothing here. And then meanwhile, Henri, the actor, this is his car. And he shows up at the police station or wherever, and he's wanting his car. And, uh, and they're stalling him while Popeye is continuing to search this car. And uh, so they ultimately figure out that the car, the weight is too much. The car shouldn't weigh as much as it does. So they have to, you know, look harder and they wind up ripping out the rocker panels and they find drugs. And so Buddy goes and he talks to Henri and he sort of apologizes for the delay. And they actually give him the car back and it looks pristine, even though we've just seen them ripping it apart. They put it all back together and I, they put the drugs back in and everything and they, they give him the car and uh, he doesn't suspect anything. And uh, he, he goes and meets with uh, Alain and he basically says, I'm done with this, you know, and Alan says, no, no, I need you to do one more thing. And he warns him that he is an accomplice, you know, so if things go bad, he's going to be one of the people in trouble. And he says, I don't care. And he walks away. And so that's kind of the end of the car sequence. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, it was a little far fetched that they were able to put the car back together after ripping it piece, you know, piece by piece and just tearing yeah. it apart. And suddenly yeah. it's perfect as soon as he walks in. I, mean, <laughs> I know this is based on a true story, but that was a little, that seems a little far fetched. Um, it's yeah. po maybe possible that they found the drugs easier in mm -hmm. reality, but they had to dramatize it more for the movie. That yeah. would make more sense because otherwise, what we saw them do to that car, there's no way that they would yeah. be able to put it back together flawlessly. Um, Later yeah. on, did, did we see them test the drugs in this section? Did you get that far? Um, well, they about? they pulled the drugs out and then they put them back in. So we no, I'm saying see the, the criminals. Did they? Oh no, no. Okay, no, we don't. See I'm them. going we too far. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah, continue. 
All right. So then, you know, we're basically coming up to the big finale, which is Alan drives the car to the uh, a remote warehouse somewhere. And there's lots of guys there and they get the drugs out of the car and they run tests and it's all good. And the money is brought out in briefcases and uh, the money is loaded into a car that uh, was purchased at an auction earlier in the film. And they celebrate and then they drive off in this car. And uh, Alan runs into a roadblock. And this is where uh, Popeye is there waving at him, calling back to the moment on the subway. And so the police have blocked everything off. There's no way out. So he turns the car around and they go back the other way. The cops kind of move in and they start busting people and there's a big shootout and Alan runs off on foot and Popeye chases after Alan in the dark warehouse tunnels. And uh, this is where we come to the really dark kind of ending where Popeye accidentally shoots and kills Mulderig, who is one of the federal agents that he's been disagreeing with throughout the whole movie. There's a real tension between these guys. Um, and Popeye seems completely over the edge at this point. You know, he's he's convinced that Alan is there somewhere and he kind of runs off to find him and he disappears from sight. And then we hear a single gunshot ring out and the screen goes black. Um, thoughts on this? Yeah, I think you were really determined to finish this in one section. Man. <laughs> I think you got to go to bed or you got a writing assignment because I haven't seen you gun through a movie like this since Woman Under the Influence. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, two of the best moments, two of the better moments in the film, at least. The Wave by Doyle, uh, which is the callback, like, you know, previously mentioned by both of us. And then the ending where... He kills another cop and then it ends with a gunshot. We don't know who's gone or who's being shot. And, um, you know, it just goes to black, leaving it mysterious. And there wasn't a lot of character development. There wasn't a lot of story. There wasn't a lot of arc to the character of Doyle. But this was one aspect that they did emphasize with him is his obsession. And he's so obsessed that he ends up killing another cop. And he doesn't yeah. even have an emotional reaction because he's so like in the moment of like this guy cannot get away. He's just yeah. so obsessed with his job and so obsessed with getting the criminals in. It'd be nice to know like where this obsession is coming from or like why he's like this or something about the character. Uh, we don't mm -hmm. get that, but we do get the fact that, you know, this is who this character is, good or bad or indifferent. This is who he is, and this is who he is um, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, it makes him a good cop, and it also makes him a rest reckless cop. And then, uh, I, again, I, I don't think this movie could have ended any more apropos or whatever uh, phrase you want to put in there that makes it seem yeah. like, uh, you know, this is the only way this movie should have ended. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And they do give us title cards at the end that sort of explain what happened to all the characters. And the general feeling you get is that not much came of this, really. Like, most of the people didn't get punished uh, or a very, very brief punishment. Uh, the guy who got the most punishment was the actor, um, which is interesting. The actor who really didn't do anything except drive the car over. But, um, yeah, so it's kind of a dark, noirish ending in a way. <laughs> 